Hello, welcome to our webinar, How to Make Data Monetization Everybody's Business. I'm Elizabeth Heichler, Editorial Director at MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator today. This free webinar is made possible with support from our sponsor, Amazon Business. Now, on to the event today. We all know that organizational data is an important asset. The most valuable companies today have largely gotten that way thanks to the enormous amounts of data they capture and use. But few companies have robust strategies for converting that asset into direct financial returns. Today, we're joined by Barbara H. Wixom, Cynthia M. B., and Leslie Owens from the MIT Center for Information Systems Research. They have a new book that aims to help leaders develop and execute strategies that make data monetization a core business activity. Um, they focus on three key data monetization approaches, improving work with data, wrapping products with data, and selling information offerings. In today's webinar, we'll hear about how to convert your organization's most important data into reusable data assets. We'll also discuss the importance of involving the whole organization so that everyone has the understanding and the tools to build and harness data assets. And we'll discuss how to measure the financial value realized. Welcome, Barb, Leslie, and Cynthia. Thank you, Elizabeth. It is incredible to be here today. Um, I'm really grateful. I'm sharing a really important professional milestone. This book, Data is Everybody's Business, this is the combination of 29 years of research. That's how long I've been studying how organizations create value using data. And I'm incredibly grateful to my co-authors, Cynthia and Leslie, for helping me uh, package all of this information up, the research, and getting this to market so that people can really understand how much we know in the field about how to be great with data. The book is about data is everybody's business, but today this is a management presentation. This is Sloan Management Review. So we're going to talk about the how. We're going to talk about kind of the management facet and how to make data everybody's business at your organization. I'm really grateful for the organizations that you see here on this screen. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with MIT Scissor, but we're a nonprofit research center out of the Sloan School of Management. We've been around for 50 years, and our mission is to help leaders be great at tech. For me personally, I'm here to help people be great with, uh, with their data. These organizations help fund the center financially. They also get involved, and I lead a group of incredible leaders, chief data officers, chief analytics officers from these organizations. And they, they get involved in our research. They make sure that our research is on point, that our research is applicable. Sometimes they even help me with definitions and they did that with data monetization. So this is how we define data monetization. It's the generation of financial returns from data assets. Notice I do not say that data monetization is selling data sets. That's what most people jump to. And that's a small piece of what data monetization represents, but it's not all of it. And today as organizations, it's really important for us to think broadly about how we're generating financial returns from our data. We are already seeing indications in the research. We ran a survey in 2018 and we found that top performing organizations, and this is top performance in terms of profitability, growth, innovation, and agility, top performers attribute 10% more of overall firm revenues to data monetization than bottom performers. And I'm gonna repeat that. Top performing organizations attribute 10% more of their overall revenues to data monetization. Here's the great news. Again, as you'll see, we know a lot about how to do this. And what I want to share is a case study to bring this concept to life. We have a case that we did in our research several years ago on BBVA. It's a global bank, 130,000 employees. They operate in 30 countries. 
but they won a best practice, our case, in their data monetization practices. So I want to share what a best practice in data monetization looks like and again, what they did to get there. The reason I like this case so much is they didn't start off great. 10 years ago, BBVA was a very typical bank. Um, you could say it was a laggard when it came to data. If you looked across the bank, you would see data mining. You wouldn't see data science or contemporary types of uses. If you looked into their systems, you would see what we call at Scissor silos and spaghetti. You would see trapped uh, trapped data in systems across the organization, but it was really hard to get to that data and use it. I'm not sure how many of you can relate. We do see silos and spaghetti in a lot of our organizations in our research. Today, this is what BBVA looks like. They have an AI factory. They have data monetization happening all across the enterprise. And you can see a link between their firm performance and what they're doing with that monetization. There are accolades that they, that they win for their mobile banking. And just this year, Time ranked BBVA as one of the world's best companies. So take a look at left and right side of the screen. And I hope you're wondering, how did they get there? What was this journey like across 10 years? Well, it started with an experiment. 10 years ago, the leaders at BBVA, they became concerned with competition with fintechs. They were curious about opportunities with information. And so they sent a group of four innovators um, out to experiment with de-identified bank card data. So basically about 4 million bank records de-identified. And those data scientists, those innovators worked in learning if they could create solutions that a market would be willing to pay. It was successful. The experiment was promising. And so in 2015, BBVA started up a separate legal entity to sell solutions. And out of that, they sold something called Paystats, which was a data service, very traditional data monetization of selling data. But more excitingly, they created solutions based on this information. For instance, they created a solution for city planners to understand the implications of their city planning decisions on economic impact. They created a solution for governments to understand the impact economically of disaster relief after disastrous events like hurricanes. So a lot of promise. They were moving forward, this, this group of data scientists and developing more and more solutions. But they started interacting with other parts of the bank. They went to lunch, they went to, call, uh, to, to coffee with colleagues. And what they realized is that the techniques they were using, the sophisticated data science techniques, could be brought to bear in other parts of the bank in other kinds of projects. So for instance, there was a project working in branch optimization. This is a pretty typical kind of process in a bank, you're trying to figure out what branches to open, what branches to close, you know, how do you actually optimize your network? Well, when they brought the data science techniques and these data scientists started to advise, in the first year, they created a lift in 39 million euros of cost savings by using data science in new ways. Well, as you can imagine, the leaders were thrilled. The PV leader like, oh my gosh, we have this much uh, possible value creation from, from data across the bank. Let's start using data inside the bank instead of, you know, the selling's fine, but the very small revenue generation comparatively in terms of $39 million euro wins with bank process improvements. So the data scientists worked more and more with people throughout the bank. They also came up with a machine learning model that helped categorize spend. So for a banking consumer, they use machine learning to understand how much was utilities and how much spend was on food and, and schooling and such. Well, they pitched this machine learning model to fuel a spend categorizer digital app. And it was a wild success with consumers. 
In less than a year, there were a million regular monthly users in Spain who were accessing this spend categorizer. In fact, it was the second most used feature of their web experience, second only to money transfers. So if you look at these examples of pay stats, branch optimization, the spend categorizer, what's data monetization? All of it. All of it. And this is where we're going in terms of value creation and realization. What BBVA learned through their journey over 10 years is that you can create incredible returns from data through improving, wrapping, and selling data. So improving work, we're making, for instance, our bank branches um, more optimal. And in that, we are realizing cost savings. Honestly, we even realize some top line growth if we end up delivering our services in better ways to our customers. With wrapping, we're creating features, we're creating experiences using data analytics that delight our customers. Our customers then value our products more. And in doing so, hopefully, they're going to pay more, stay longer, you know, um, engage more heavily with us as an organization with that product. And then finally, they're selling, there's pay stats, but not just selling the data, but selling solutions as well. So improving wrapping selling, BVVA now has pervasive activities in all of these across the bank. How did they do it? Well, there were three activities, management activities that went on that really fueled their progress. And so I want to kind of open up the hood. This is the fun part about a researcher. We get to follow organizations over time and we get to see what's under the hood. We get to see what decisions were made, what happened, why did those happen? And so really what I'm going to share with you today are three management terms of knowledge building, knowledge sharing, value measurement, these are very generic right now. And so what I'd like to do is bring these to life one by one. Knowledge building. This is an actual page that came out of BBVA's efforts. And what this is, is this was actually just in a deck. This is an inventory of all of the algorithms, AI models that the data scientists at the bank developed for reuse. So this is an AI model inventory, if you will. And the way it would work is every time a new project would be initiated, a data scientist would bring this deck, this page to the project team and they would say, okay, we understand what your needs are and where you wanna go. Is there anything we already have pre-existing that we can bring to the table and use for your project? If so, they were off to the races. If not, then they would develop a new model for that particular project. But there was an understanding from the outset that a model would be introduced into this inventory for the benefit of others for the bank. I'm not sure what it's like at your organization, but in a lot of organizations we see there's a lot of local progress in data monetization, but it stays local. And so it's really important for us to think about building knowledge for our organization to make sure that we advance at the pace and at the depth that we need to. Honestly, it's like cooking. You know, I'm not sure how many of you are great cooks. I'm kind of average, but to become good at cooking, you have to start with the basics. You have to start learning how to boil eggs and cut with a knife and cut onions, you know, that type of thing. Then once you've mastered the foundations, you can move into more intermediate tasks you know, maybe making an omelet. And then finally, if you keep at it, you can move into souffle world and maybe become a master chef or at least become a super home cook. Well, that is exactly the way it works with data and data monetization. Instead of cooking with data monetization, we need five areas of knowledge, five skills that the organization has to have. We have them right here on the screen. We need data management, which produces data assets that people across the firm can find, use, and trust. 
We need a data platform that can cost efficiently, that's the key, serve up data assets both inside and outside of the firm. We need data science that can detect what humans can't. We need customer understanding. This is our understanding as an organization of core and latent needs in the market. We need this to know what direction we should be going in. And finally, we need acceptable data use. Now, some of you are probably like, is that data governance? I purposely don't use that term. And the reason is that data governance typically focuses everyone on compliance and regulation, which is absolutely critical, but it's not sufficient. Acceptable data use recognizes that we need oversight, not just for regulation and law, but also for ethics and values. And when we talk about values, it's values of the organization as well as values for the key stakeholders of the organization. So we need all of this knowledge, all of it, to become uh, good, to, be, to make progress when it comes to data monetization. And just like with cooking, these are developed in the organization using practices. So let me just take data science, for instance. We're going to start learning skills. We're going to input, um, take on practices like dashboarding, visualization, so that we understand how to do reporting. Then we're going to move into Z-scores and trend lines and probabilism, those types of practices that are required to become good at statistics. Then we can move into Python and machine learning. So this is the way this happens. And then these building of practices are happening in all of the parts of this fan you see in all of the five capabilities. Now, I'd like to pause and check in with all of you to see where you are. And let's take data science specifically. So, so if you think about the practices and what we like about practices is you can see them. So if you're looking around your organization, do you see dashboarding? Do you see visualization happening? Um, that would be an indication that you have those foundations established. Um, do you have a lot of statistics going on? You know, um, Or are you moving forward with machine learning and uh, you're really making progress with AI models and such? And I am very excited. I would say that on average in the research, we find that organizations are average in most of these um, capabilities. And I am, there we go. So 43%, um, most of us are in that we really have reporting and dashboards in hand. That's exciting. I, I hope you, if you're in this space or after, feel great about that because you have really important foundational practices. If you're just getting started, um, that's okay. That's okay. You can get started. And hopefully now um, through the webinar, you, you see what you have to do. Um, you know, it's, it's not a mystery. One of the things in the research that we've done is actually validated that practices are sequential and that you really do have to do reporting before you move on. Um, you can certainly introduce machine learning, for instance, or this year, generative AI from a learning perspective. However, um, when you don't have the capability foundations in place, what it means is that most of the organization will be unable to absorb what you're introducing, um, which is why, again, even if you bring in some advanced stuff, you, you still want to make sure you're focusing on practices that are building the foundations that are needed for, for your capabilities. Okay. Well, wonderful. Well, let's move on. So that was all about knowledge building. And what's great about knowledge building is that that's created data assets. We, I should say, we, we distinguish data from data assets. You know, data can be any data. Data isn't necessarily useful. Data assets are those cohesive sets of data that are prepared by those capabilities that we just talked about. Now it's about how do we make sure that data assets are that people are helping to build those data assets across the organization and that they're being leveraged. Well, that takes knowledge sharing. So I want to share here. This is a picture from two pictures from BBVA. On the left, this is Marco Bresson, Elena Alfaro, two incredible data leaders. And this is an event that they hosted called BBVA Brainstorm. 
this brainstorm event was really important for BBVA because they set a very aggressive goal. They wanted 130,000 employees, all of them, to understand AI. That was their goal. Well, of course, that did not mean that all tellers had to understand how to program in Python, but it did mean that all tellers and everyone in between, you know, across the organization had to understand what AI meant, what big data meant, you know, what was machine learning. And so this particular event was a way to set some common language, level set for the masses, if you will. Um, this event, when it happened, it reached immediately 18,000 of the employees through both those who attended live and who attended through live stream. Then this was captured by the organization and it became one of their most watched development videos, um, I think still to this day. I might be misspeaking, but last I heard that was the case. Um, this was really important for, for BBVA um, because it not only educated on terms, it also put the terms in context. So the data leaders and the business leaders at this event got up and spoke about how AI, big data, these types of concepts were happening right now in the organization and what outcomes were happening because of it. So it did a really nice job of pulling in people across the bank to get them excited about the possibilities of AI and these contemporary uses of data. Again, I'm going back to cooking. You know, it's not enough if we have a restaurant to have a head chef who knows all about cooking and has a, a mastery at delivering food. Everybody has to be a part of it. They play some role at different levels and in different ways. And so what we need to do in organizations is find ways to establish knowledge sharing where we have actually knowledge going both ways. You know, in the case of, of a kitchen, you want the the master chef to really make sure everyone's on the same page in terms of how different dishes have to be prepared, you know, what goes into creating the dishes that are important for that particular restaurant. But then there's kind of two ways. Those who are serving uh, might also be sharing back with the chef what's working, what's not with the clientele. And maybe this woman that we're seeing here up front, maybe she just watched a TikTok video with a really cool way to slice and dice that helps people in the kitchen because it's a, an emergent contemporary idea. But this is what we have to think about as leaders and managers is how do we really make sure knowledge sharing happens in our organization to get that everybody involved in data monetization. In the research, the way in which this is done is through what we call connections. Years ago, there was a story, um, well, it's not even a story, my story now of a conference I attended. It was years ago though, and it was a data conference. And at the conference, it was a really nice idea where a data leader came with a business leader. And when they got to the conference, they checked in and the data person got a red shirt and the business person got a blue shirt and they attended the conference together. They did some exercises together over a couple of days. And then at the end of that event, they left with purple shirts. Brilliant, brilliant. So we have continued to use that concept in these connections that you see here. Basically in the research, we found five different organizational de um, designs that organizations can put in place. And what these designs do is that they connect people in different ways for different purposes, but through the connections, through the knowledge sharing that happens through them, the red and blue people become more purple. The event that you saw at BBVA, that's an example of a many-to-many -many connection. That's a networked event. Many-to-many -many connections can also be virtual, like communities of practices. That, that would be another really good example of this kind of connection. So we want to make sure that we have these connections. And by the way, just establishing the connections aren't necessarily sufficient. We also have to make sure we motivate people to engage. And so there's a connection component through design. There's also a motivation component where we would use anything from mandates of the firm to value propositions to encourage use, um, even sometimes a little bit of peer pressure or social norms to get folks involved. But it's really important a lot of times when we work with organizations and they're finding that data monetization progress isn't happening fast enough, we'll say, you know, 
Check your connections. How, what's your organization design? How are you making sure that your data and domain expertise is being shared so that we can spread practices, so that we can innovate new practices? So something to think about where you are today. Last picture from BBVA. This is one of my favorites. This is the way that BBVA really kept their projects on track financially. And I think it's important to share when BBVA set up a separate legal entity for pay stats, that entity was expected to be self-sufficient and to self-fund. At the end of the day, when, when an organization has to find a way to measure data and data monetization, they do. So when you have to self-fund, you figure it out. And so I'm saying this because a lot of times people are like, I don't know how to measure the impact of data, the, the returns from data. And I get it. It's really hard for a lot of reasons. And we share a lot of those reasons in the book, um, but it can be done. And we see this in the research again and again. So here's what they did at BBVA. First, they hired someone with a financial background. So they had someone from finance and with financial acumen to help in terms of, of creating this. And, and what they did is they created a triangle where anytime a new project was initiated, that project was placed on this framework as a project either expected to drive a lot of cost reduction, drive revenue increase, or basically capability build. Now, this does two things. The first is it allows you to manage data monetization initiatives like a portfolio to make sure that you're not just using data to bring down cost, um, that you're not just capability building, that you're making sure that returns actually happen. The second thing is that it shows that because there are different economic expectations, there should also be different methodologies involved in measuring what the impact of these different projects are. And so the finance um, lead, as well as the data scientists work together to figure out, OK, if we are working on cost reduction, then we're probably or we will be using more Six Sigma and process management types of methods in order to manage what the impact of these projects are. Whereas if we're on the right on the left side where we're looking at increases to revenues, then we are looking at either. We're just doing basic accounting because we're realizing revenues and we have royalty sharing and such going on. Or if we're talking about things like a spend categorizer and mobile banking, then we're using techniques like um, A-B testing or controlled experiments to understand what the impact of those kinds of projects are. The other reason I love the economic impact framework concept is when you are purposeful about value and returns at the project level, when, you, when you're launching these new initiatives, it makes you go all the way through what we call the value creation process, right? So for instance, with bank branch optimization, you know, first we start with data, maybe it's you know, banking data, consumer banking behavior, and other types of data that we're using to start off. Then we move on to the insight that we're going to derive from that regarding bank branch optimization. For BBVA, there was a lot of AI models. So when we talk about AI today, that's the second step in this process, right? That's where the insight comes out. And so, for instance, in this case of bank branch optimization, our insight could be which banks to close, which banks to open. As simple as that. The action then is we need to close the banks or we need to open new branches. We have to do that. You know, no value is going to be created until that happens. But when we do the close the banks or open the banks, then the value we create is an optimized network that's hopefully more appealing to our customers and also drives efficiencies for us as a bank. But there's more. There's also, and, and a lot of times organizations stop here with value creation, but one of, I think the big points that we make in the book, and then I think it's really important for um, everybody to understand about the research is that we have to move all the way through to value realization. So for instance, if BBVA shuts down a branch, but then can't get out of a lease and we're still paying for the branch, there's no value realized. 
right? Or if we shut down a branch and we still retain all of the headcount, we just move them to other branches. We don't have headcount reduction that we can see on a bottom line. Now, sometimes maybe we don't want that. Sometimes maybe we, we need organizational slack. Maybe we really need to reallocate people because we are understaffed and that's just fine. But the importance of making sure we're purposeful about exactly what value we're creating, exactly what kind of value we want to realize in organization, it's really important to move all the way through that. So when we say data monetization, I'm going to just highlight this. This is what we mean by data val uh, realization. Now, I'm going to go back to improve wrap cell, and I want to do one more example because I think this demonstrates why we distinguish improving from wrapping, from selling. If we take a wrap example, which is like the spend categorizer, okay, let's go through this process one more time. The data could be also banking behavior, could be our consumer banking behavior and some other data potentially that we use in order to produce that spend categorizer. The insight would be, again, the AI model, the optimization model that we're using in order to break out the spend. And by the way, this was a machine learning task. This was pretty tough because if you're trying to tell a consumer how much they're spending in different areas, but let's say a lot of the banking records are money transfers, where it's not, it doesn't say rent. It doesn't say, you know, there's a, there's a lot that goes, it, it's harder than you think in terms of recognizing what kind of spend is associated with what kind of category. And so that's why machine learning was used in this case. And then in terms of action, instead of the bank, we now need the customer to take an action. We need the customer to realize through an insight, I'm spending too much on utilities. I need to stop using my lights or I need to stop leaving my lights on during the day. And it's the lights off during the day that reduces the utilities bills. So I, I have, I make money or I save money as a consumer. That's the value creation for the consumer. But then as the bank, we hope that that value creation for a consumer, consumer delighted them so much that they want to stay longer with the bank and hit our retention rates in a good way. Or maybe we have uh, we're more pleased and so we're going to use our banking services more. So the mechanisms are different for improving wrapping selling, but each of them has to move from data all the way to value realization to monetize. Now, after three years, BBVA, they launched more than 40 data science projects. So it's three years, three years. That's not too long. That's not a decade, three years. And they did this for 27 business units. That represents a third of the business units at BBVA. And 24 of them were already when they when they had they ended the three years were generating financial returns and they know this because they measured it which is pretty super this is what i'm really hoping organizations are start are going to start doing more and more of so one more poll now you know what we mean by data monetization we're improving we're wrapping we're selling we have capabilities we have everybody involved through doc democracy uh, we're treating this like a business. We're really understanding what the payoffs are. Um, so how would you describe the state of data monetization at your organization? And I'm sure you all have stuff going on with data. I'm sure you are. And so um, wherever you are, the key is to think about this as a journey and it's never too late um, to move forward. And Barb, while people are taking the poll, I'm just going to jump in and uh, say, we, let's, if we can wrap up in about five minutes. Sounds that's great. great. Perfect. And let's see where we are. Okay. So working on it. Well, again, most of you are working on it. That is, I couldn't imagine hearing better news. This is wonderful. And for those where monetization isn't on your radar, I hope it is now. I hope it is now. And what's great about it when you are um, not leading the pack is that there's a lot we know. So hopefully you can um, get rid of missteps and such um, and really embrace the stuff that we know about so that you can monetize well. Okay, let's wrap up here. 
one of the key messages, regard, regardless if you are super right now with data monetization or if you are just even thinking about maybe getting started, is that anyone can succeed. Again, I've studied organizations for 29 years. Um, it's been a very happy career because I see a lot of successes. That's what I study. I know organizations can do it, and I know any organization can do it. Government, nonprofit, commercial, you can do this. Um, from a managerial perspective, it's about knowledge building to get the, those data assets um, at play, knowledge sharing to include everybody, and value measurement to make sure we are thinking like a business so that this is sustainable. So now, what can you do? You can do a lot. Just each individual. The first thing is get involved in a project. Look around, you know, is there some kind of improvement or wrap? Uh, maybe you're in R&D or in business development and there's there's some kind of selling or solution that's being considered. Uh, there is no better way to become good as individuals and as a human uh, as an organization uh, in data monetization than to practice it. Take a class and there is a lot of out there in terms of education. Um, if you are a domain person, take a data class. But if you're a data person, take a domain class, right? Get to know even more deeply the subject matter that's important to your organization. So you can kind of help fire up the data on all cylinders. And then even if you don't start a project, one exercise I think is helpful is pick a use case. Pick a way that data can help improve wrap sell and see if you can trace that use case all the way from data to value realization and think about how would you measure that? How would you make sure that the organization drove returns? And then of course, we hope you'll read the book and benefit from it. Um, I can't be more excited about sharing what we know with you. And with that, I think it's time for Q&A. Uh, it is indeed, hi. Thank you so much. What a fantastic presentation. And, uh, and the book is, is tremendous. It's really, really rich. So I feel like we just kind of got a taste of, of, of your overall framework and approach here. But it's you know, fantastic. Thank you. Um, we've got some good questions coming in. And, uh, just to get started with those. And I'm going to toss the questions to you as a group and uh, let you uh, sort of signal to each other what you want to somebody wants to take it. Um, so to start with, uh, do you have to build capabilities from scratch? Because I think a lot of people. <laughs> I think Cynthia has to take this one. She's quite passionate about this, this area. Yes. This, this is my favorite topic. <laughs> of course, you don't have to build them from scratch, but you do have to build them. As Barb's point was about, you have to adopt practices uh, that will help you build capabilities across the organization. Yes, you can buy them, um, but my advice would be if you think you know a small company that has incredible AI capabilities, make sure you look at it at that organization and make sure that they have practices, they have the practice foundation for those capabilities. You'd be surprised how many people have just a smart person and no capabilities, right? So be cautious in trying to purchase capabilities. But mostly capabilities come from being exposed to knowledge in a course or a YouTube video, or I don't know, I don't think a TikTok video, but YouTube videos can introduce you to a lot of concepts like customer journeys and but it's the application of those thing those concepts in practice in projects with colleagues in organizations in particular organizations that brings them alive and helps really develop the knowledge that is this resource this that we're trying to develop to to build on okay and now how do you decide where to begin with improving wrapping or selling Leslie you want to take it Okay, sure. Um, well, improving is the most common approach to data monetization. And that makes sense because as you work, you look around and you say, could I make this process better? Could I improve this day to day task? Um, wrapping is customer focused. And so as you're hearing about friction with your customers, this is hard to use. This is hard to understand. You know, you might be spotting an opportunity to enhance your product with data. And then selling is um, that you're actually commercializing data. You know, you might need more entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and different, different approaches can work for different industries, different organizations. It's not one size fits all. People experiment, try different ones at different times. 
Yeah, I mean, just real quick, because I know people hate when academics say it depends, but it actually <laughs> depends. It really does. Um, because, you know, think about it. If you're an information business, if that's what you're setting out, and there's a lot of those springing out today with digital data sources and such, um, well, then you're going to start with selling, right, to become really good at selling. And then you're going to start wrapping in order to distinguish what you're selling. Um, like Leslie said, a lot of organizations start with improving. Some organizations choose just to improve and just to improve. You know, it really depends a lot on your business model, your strategic intent and such to figure out um, what makes sense for you. I'll add <laughs> that in our data, organizations and uh, companies and all industries are start in all of these different places. Yeah. They focus on different aspects. So we've got people in financial services that really focus mainly on improving, other companies that focus mainly on selling, others that focus mainly on wrapping. So across industry, you know, there's like not even an industry answer for this. Yeah, that's true. Okay. All right, now I love this next question. Um, Albert in our audience is getting right to the uh, the heart of some, the politics that sometimes come up in these issues. What if each business unit or division wants to do this their own way and there is reluctance to collaborate? I can't imagine that happens. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We see it all the time. We see it all the time. I think what's really important for organizations is to understand that there's going to be localized activity and then there's globalized act or centralized activity, right? And that's really the hard job of a good data leader these days yeah. is, is to orchestrate that. Because honestly, you don't want to tamp down localized activities. I mean, if all of your BUs want to do stuff with data analytics that's best for them, then that could be a great way to build capabilities and such. The key though is as this local innovation and activity is happening, that you are somehow using those practices to build for the enterprise. So it's how do you coordinate back? A lot of times it's incentivizing that. One thing I forgot to mention about BBVA is that they had KPIs at the organizational level of capability building. One of my favorite ones, it was called data liberation, data liberation. So every time a data set moved from a local group up to their data platform, it was a KPI win that was rewarded and shared and such. So those are the kinds of things we need to put in place to really make sure that build out happens and that coordination gets in sync. Got it, okay. Um, and then uh, Jose asks, did BBVA change their IT and business structures um, to uh, address the new data monetization strategy? Very, very much they did. And and they're still to this day changing. I mean, today BBB looks nothing like we, you know, when we last finished it, which is wonderful. Um, so, so for instance, what they had to do is uh, well, first they had to share with IT that there are uh, needs in data science, data monetization capabilities that might not be consistent with IT, for instance, IT had standards, IT had regulatory requirements, like you couldn't use cloud, but yet for the data science practices, you needed to have a cloud platform. And so there was a lot of compromise and communication and coordination that had to happen between IT and data science to even understand what the organization needed. And then because they wanted to um, have an enterprise approach and a coordinated centralized um, uh, set of practices, then they absolutely had to work with IT. So it became a close collaboration so that IT could really revamp what they had um, within the organization and um, help operationalize what was needed for the data science activities. Okay, thank you. And now um, I have a question about leadership um, and uh, Maybe if, if, if I, before I ask the question, if I can invite you to think on the uh, the cases that you've worked with and and what some practices that maybe have been particularly um, noteworthy in this regard. What's required from leadership to shift culture and mindset to fully adopt a data monetization mindset? What have you seen that uh, leaders at some of the organizations like BBVA have done sort of at that higher level? I have an answer, but Cynthia or Leslie, you want to take that? So, uh, yeah, I'll start. Um, for me, it's the, uh, the, the central thing is having a vision, right? And communicating that vision 
constantly and repeatedly and then putting incentives behind that division. For example, what Barb mentioned is like creating a KPI that if you share your data, you get a reward of some sort, right? You get, you get a medal, I don't know. But yeah, so clear vision backed up with incentives, but repeating that vision constantly is the, the one thing that really sticks in my brain. Yeah, I, I would agree. We in, in the book, we talk a lot about um, Microsoft and Satya Nadella when he took over and was transforming Microsoft from a product based to a cloud services based organization. And he had clarity and vision consistently around data analytics. We are going to use data analytics and be evidence based to change work. So that was an improving organization for the first few years at Microsoft using data analytics to improve work, to actually change and re-engineer work in order to help with that um, complete transformation of, of their business model. But the clarity you know, and, and the consistency of his message, both inside and outside of the firm. Now I will say he also um, structurally made some changes. So for instance, to really ensure that people across uh, Microsoft started thinking differently and started putting more emphasis on the customer, he eradicated all of the different PLs, the product silos, um, and then had, for instance, enterprise sales that crossed the organization that was truly enterprise sales. He changed the incentives for the employees so that a third of performance review was how well um, a worker would communicate and collaborate outside their current work unit, things like that. So it's, it's a combination of that vision and communication and such, but then also you do have to do some stuff managerially to activate that. Right. Okay. Now, um, George in our audience is sharing his reality on data governance, which is that it is tying up about 85% of resources on data management and monetization. Are there solutions to accomplish both monetization and regulatory compliance? Absolutely. So really, you're not going to make much progress. And I'm sorry, I'm just jumping in here because I feel really passionate about <laughs> governance. Um, you cannot move forward with data monetization if you don't have that governance piece. And I'm even going to make it harder. It's not just regulation and, and law. Again, it's that ethics and, and values and such. You have to get that right, because if you don't have your solid, acceptable data use, then people just freeze up because they don't know what they should be doing. You know, most of us really do want to comply and we do want to use data in the right ways. So it takes practices, it takes communication, it takes, you know, a lot of the organizations that we're studying that are effective with data governance, they are bringing people together from across the organization to work this through. This is a collaborative effort. What you do not want is to have a siloed data governance group that has been charged with go figure out oversight, that will not work. This is a business type of activity where together um, we have to have recurring ability to oversee and manage what decisions are being made about our data. Okay. So it's not easy. And that I think that's the other important thing is over the years is there's no silver bullet. There's no magic solution and it's okay. You can still make progress. So really the best way to become great at data monetization is just to like keep doing it, keep trying. You know, if people ever get frustrated, you know, reach out to us, we'll encourage you because we do see that organizations can get over whatever hurdle it is that they, they have. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll add a coda to that. And that is, if there's not enough money to spend on uh, creating data knowledge, capabilities and data assets, then the problem actually is probably that no one is measuring data monetization. Right? No one is recognizing how much value is already being created from the data, right? And so a good way to stimulate additional funding, the flow of additional funding into the creation of data resources is to actively measure outcomes probably already in play. What are we getting from our data resources now? Then that tells you there's probably more money there than you expect. If you're doing a great job of governance, probably. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing, Cynthia, that, that when you realize how incredibly enormous the investments you've made in data and technology are, it would maybe stimulate people to start on their data monetization journey right now. Okay, great. 
Thank you. Um, now, you know, we did see in the polling that a good portion of our audience is, you know, it's early days. Um, so I wanted to ask, if you're just starting out with this, how do you identify the most potentially valuable data sets? You know, are there particular criteria or characteristics that, that kind of flag um, promising ones? Can I take this one? Uh, well, there's there's two ways you can approach it if you're just getting started. The first is to think about data assets that have the greatest ability to be reused and recombined. And so you can focus on a data asset that might be strategically important or broadly relevant. And let me give you an example. One of the example or one of the companies in our research is FEMSA. So they own OXO convenience stores in South America. And they created a data asset called dead net profit. And that allowed for the calculation of skew level profitability for all kinds of activities across FEMSA. So for instance, if we are one of the OXO operations managers and we're trying to set store hours, we could rely on dead net profit. Or if we're trying to understand sales and marketing and advertising strategies for our products, we could rely on dead net profit or, you know, so supply chain could use dead net profit in order to better negotiate contracts. And so that was an example of just a broadly relevant data asset. Now, it took a year to build that data asset. But once the data asset is in play for reuse and recombination, once you get the governance right on that particular asset, then the amount of value creation is mind boggling in all kinds of ways and tech could be improving wrapping and selling. You know, another way to do it is instead of broadly relevant asset, it could be something that's strategically important. So at BNP Paribas, for instance, when they um, introduced a strategy to really um, go hard at ESG, you know, a good way to make sure that um, environment, social um, governance types of um, concepts were informing decision investment decision across BNP, they invested in an ESG data asset. So, and then the second thing you do, that's, that's kind of taking it the asset route, and then it's going to be reused and such. The other is to go for the initiative itself, to pick an initiative, and then use that initiative to build up a data asset out of it. And that's kind of what BBVA did. You know, you start with bank branch distribution, big win, get a lot of people excited, and then make sure that all that you accumulated from that project gets reused, and then you move on from there, and then you start the snowball. Okay, thank you. Um, what are the biggest mistakes people make in setting out to do this? I'll start. <laughs> Not measuring value realized. Okay. Stopping at value creation, or even worse, stop as Barb said, stopping at action, right? Like, oh, you're so excited that you actually closed some branches or opened some new branches, which is just taking action. You don't even actually count up how much value was really created and then how much of that value actually made it to the bottom line. So I would say stopping early. That's the first thing. It's hard, but it's not impossible. Um, especially in a specific case, it's not, it's even more feasible, but yeah, that would be my number one. Okay. I have one. It's, it's leaving everything to a center of excellence. You know, I think, I think organizations become enamored with a center of excellence. And, and there's a reason why. So in those org designs, those connecting structures that we, that we talked about, most of them have a single kind of result. So you have a connection, for instance, with that many-to-many. -many, um, and the result of that is, is, is um, kind of the spread of best practices. It helps you scale practices, frankly. Um, and then you have other practices that help with innovation. Well, the great thing about a center of excellence is that you can both innovate. Um, so as a center of excellence works across the business, you're innovating new kinds of, of work practices and such. You can also scale as they share their knowledge, their learning and doing it in other places. But the problem is it's not enough. It's not enough. It becomes a bottleneck if um, and it doesn't communicate that data monetization is everybody's business, which it is. You know, we need everybody to be contributing to data assets, to using data assets. And so I think that's a big misstep. It's fine to use a center of excellence to maybe start things up or maybe as your coordinating mechanism for the organization, but you also wanna make sure you have all kinds of knowledge sharing happening across the firm. Okay, great. 
And thank you. That was a nice segue on the organizational stuff to our next question. Well, Jorge asks, what changes do I need to implement in my organizational governance to promote data monetization? Take that. <laughs> Yeah. What kind of organization? <laughs> I, know. Nice. I know. I wish we could get Jorge on here to. Uh, I know. If wanna, um, Jorge, if you want to, if you can elaborate on your organization in the Q and A, we will grab that. And well, so, so again, I think, I think what we have to think about is what do we want happening? Right. So we want to build, build knowledge. That's so, so you have to think about your organization. So, uh, for instance, at Scissor, you know, we have some research from back in the day that talks about different kinds of operating models of organizations, you know, if, I, if you're highly diversified as a company, if you're very unified as an organization and such. And so there are different implications if you're, you know, again, different kinds of designs have different implications. But regardless of what kind of organization you are and how you're designed and structured, um, there are different ways to build knowledge and share knowledge that are effective for you. So I think that's what's important is to, as a manager, understanding that you have to build knowledge and then you have to think about, okay, for my company, how is that going to happen? And in some companies it might be easy, you know, where if you just are already sharing practices, if you're already kind of centrally motivated, if you're very diversified, maybe that's going to be tougher. And so if you just focus on the knowledge building, sharing value measurement as management practices, then I do think then you can put strategies to execute that regardless of what your context is. Okay, great. And let's see, we just have a few minutes left. Um, so uh, uh, here, here's, uh, here's one that might be uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the shorter side, um, uh, specifically about you know, professional service firms. Um, how applicable is the this, this strategy to that kind of a business? Very. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Leslie. Well, I used to work in a professional services firm, and um, and I think a lot of the work is around helping your clients build capabilities. And so you can imagine that anybody in professional services could be helping people with their data management problems, helping people with their data science problems. Um, and also, it's a very knowledge intensive business. And so there's a ripe improving uh, opportunities all around you, you know, processes that could be cheaper, things that could be more efficient. So I actually feel like it's a fertile environment for improving and, uh, and a lot of customer pain to be solved around capability building. So I also started off at consulting and uh, consulting firms cannot be the case of the cobbler's children, which they, I find often are. <laughs> And so they need to be monetizing. They need to think about, you know, how can we be creating data assets? And, and a lot of the organizations we work with are professional services. So how are we creating data assets that we can be using as a part of our solutions? Right. You know, can we be creating mm. scoring or methodologies that are part of, for instance, our auditing work that we can add to distinguish our auditing services from someone else's auditing services, right? Mm -hmm. So you absolutely can be improving wrapping and selling just like any organization. Mm -hmm. And what we don't want to do, like Leslie described, is just be helping our clients with this. We need to be benefiting as well from, from data and from data monetization. Great. And we are just about out of time. So thank you. That was a great discussion. Um, really appreciate Barb, Leslie, and Cynthia for being here, for sharing your insights. We'd like to also thank our sponsor, Amazon Business, for making it possible for us to offer this um, webinar for free. Thank you all very much for being here, and we hope we'll see you again at another uh, MIT SMR webinar. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. Thank you.